Hey guys, my name is Jose Ocando. I'm a Chattanooga based web designer and Webflow developer. And in this video, we're talking about custom code. <laughs> now I know that Webflow is leading the quote unquote, no code revolution. And I'm a strong supporter of that big believer. Um, I use this product every day in my business. Uh, but the truth is that um, with a majority of my projects, I end up using a little bit of custom code to tweak certain things, um, especially uh, CMS collections or CMS items. So this tutorial is really all about that. Um, I also threw in a couple of just for fun type of stuff that you can't do natively in Webflow. It isn't really necessary, but uh, like I said, just for fun. Um, and then I also want to let you know that I'm partly doing this tutorial um, to promote, I just launched a new Skillshare class called Webflow for Beginners. So this tutorial is going to be for intermediate or advanced users. If you're a beginner, you're just getting started, you know zero. Uh, this is probably not the video for you, but that Skillshare class might be a helpful thing to take. Um, and so I'll have information in the description box and I'll plug it one more time halfway through this tutorial. All right, with that out of the way, let's get started. Before we jump into implementing our first piece of custom code, I just want to offer you a few resources. Now, if you're like me, I know just enough code to totally break a website. <laughs> so I often need to refer to documentation. And so here are four places where you can find that. And these are really, really helpful. One is can I use.com. Now, can I use is the question is, okay, if I'm implementing some custom code, is it widely supported on all browsers? So for example, one of the ones that we're going to be using shortly is writing mode uh, here. I already pulled it up and green represents um, a piece of custom code that would be supported widely across all browsers and red would be not supported. So you want to double check to make sure that the solution that you're trying to use is widely supported. And if it's not, you need to have a fallback or just not use it. Second one would be Mozilla Firefox. Um, now Mozilla is um, a nonprofit and it's uh, made by developers for developers, uh, that's their tagline. <laughs> but I think because of that, their documentation is really good and super easy to understand. W3 Schools is another one that is just very like elementary, like the, the foundations of uh, HTML and CSS. So very, very helpful. And then finally, CSS uh, tr uh, Tricks. I think the founder is Chris Coyier. Um, just really, really helpful. He's got a very interactive audience um, who are, will post comments and helpful things like that. He's always updating blog articles and just really, really helpful to find um, how to implement things. All right, so those are four races, resources. <laughs> I'll make sure to link them in the description box for you guys to check out. All right, so let's jump into our first implementation. Now, a trend that I've seen over the last several years is using vertical text, like the one over here on the right-hand side. Now, there are times where it's really easy to implement just using a transform and rotating it 90 degrees, uh, but there are times where that just doesn't work or it really interferes with the layout. Um, and so I found a CSS property that makes this really, really easy to do. Now, if I jump into Mozilla, speaking of resources, I've pulled up the CSS property for writing mode in the uh, Mozilla documentation. And uh, down here, you can see uh, these are the keyword values that we can use with writing mode. And then down here, we actually have this little handy chart that shows us what it should look like. And so this one right here is exactly what we need. So vertical RL, that needs to be the value that we use with our new CSS property. And so let's jump into Webflow. So a couple of notes. First is I want to make sure um, I'm targeting my combo class uh, for this overline and not the overline class itself because I use overline elsewhere on the website and I don't want all of those to be vertical. I just want this one. Uh, so I'm going to copy uh, that to my clipboard. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm actually not going to go into the pages and start writing custom code here. I'm actually going to go into the navigator and add an embed, an HTML embed. And the uh, reason for that is because, uh, let me just scoot that up to the top for a second. The reason for that is because uh, by adding the CSS in the embed, I'm actually going to be able to see right here in the Webflow Designer, all of that custom code take place. Um, so I don't have to polish it and then look at the live website. I can see it happen right here in the designer. And that's really, really helpful. Um, now, I will say that uh, when I'm ready to launch a project, I will often move things out of the HTML embed and put them into like the project settings custom code so it's applied site-wide. Uh, but while I'm working um, in the designer, it's helpful to see everything take place right there. 
right, so let's open up the editor. And the first thing we need to do is add some style tags. That's what lets the browser know, hey, this is CSS. So we have an opening and a closing tag. And then we're going to need to add our CSS class. All right, so there it is. That's what lets the browser know, hey, we're targeting this specific class. We need opening and closing brackets. And then we're going to use our writing mode CSS property. Writing mode. And then let's go ahead and go to the Mozilla documentation and copy the actual value, paste it in, and then we need a semicolon to finish it off, save and close. And now that our text is a vertical, we didn't need to use a transform and it looks great. Next up is blend modes. Now, if you've ever used Photoshop or Sketch or something like that, you've probably used a blend mode to have one layer interact with another. Uh, what do I mean? Well, notice that the header has this solid color gray background, but if I go to my live site, it actually shows the background photo underneath. That's because the solid layer is being multiplied on top of that background photo. And then if I scroll down to the call to action section below, it actually has the same um, like thing applied to it. Now they actually have two different CSS properties um, applied to them, and they're used in different situations. So I wanna show you both. All right, so I'm going to go into Webflow, and let's actually apply it to the call to action section first because it's the easiest. If I click on section and go to my style tab, scroll down to backgrounds, you'll notice that I've got two background layers. One is the photo, and one is that dark slate solid color background. So what I'm going to do is apply a CSS property called background blend mode to make those two layers interact and have the top layer multiplied on top of the bottom one. Let's go ahead and copy that combo class click on the embed. It's going to zoom us up to the top, but we'll scroll back down so that we can see uh, what we're doing <laughs> and then open up the embed there. All right, so I'm going to hit enter a couple of times, add our CSS class, opening and closing brackets, and now we're ready to go. Like I said, the property we're using is called background blend mode. Okay, and then the value we want to do is multiply. Okay, I think I spelled everything correctly. All right, so now those two layers are interacting. The top one is being multiplied on top of the bottom one. And now the background is nice and dark and it's easy for us to read this white text. Okay, the next one is if we scroll back up to the header, uh, it's actually got a little bit of a more complicated um, configuration because you'll notice that I've got the header element. And then if I go to the style tab, it's got the photo, same photo applied to it, I think. Then I've got another background element. And finally, I've got a header overlay that has a solid color. All right, so I want that solid color to be multiplied not only on the header, but on this background element as well. So in other words, I'm trying to multiply on top of everything below it. Uh, so I can't use background blend mode uh, for this specific situation. I want to use mix blend mode. All right, so let's copy this class open up our embed. We're going to go ahead and reference it again with opening and closing brackets. And then we want to use mix blend mode instead of background blend mode. But we're going to use the same value, multiply. All right, so now that solid color gray background is being multiplied on everything below it. And that way we get this other kind of like zoomed out effect that I wanted uh, for, my, uh, for my header. So for this next piece of custom code, we're going to be working with CMS collections. Now if I hop back out to my live site, um, this section is actually controlled by a CMS. And we've got this really fun staggered look where as you scroll down, the photo kind of changes placement. It hops from the left to the right and uh, so forth. All right, so if I wanted to do that in the designer, I would come out here. And what I've done is with subsection, I've used Flexbox to create that, um, that layout. And what I simply do is click on this little icon called reverse, and that would reverse the um, layout for me. But the issue is that it's actually applied that to all of the sections and not just this one. Well, but that's how collections work is any change that you make inside of a collection is going to be applied to all of the children. There's not a way for me to target uh, any specific child inside of that collection. Uh, unless I use <laughs> custom code. All right, so this is where the beauty of the pseudo class called nth child comes in. Um, so if I go to 
this one right here and click on subsection. Remember, subsection is the class where I want to apply that reverse function to. So I'm going to copy that class, come back out to my HTML embed, scroll down so that I can see if my work is working correctly. And let's go ahead and copy that or paste that class there. Do my opening and closing brackets. And then inside, we're going to use flex direction is the CSS property row reverse. So it's, this would be the exact same thing as if I clicked that icon. Uh, so if I just click save and close, you see that the same thing happened. So that icon, when Webflow spits out the CSS, it's using that same uh, CSS property and value. All right, but that's not what we want, right? We don't want that change to happen to all of them. <laughs> um, so the way that we do that is with the pseudo class called nth child. And pseudo means, uh, actually, I don't know exactly what it means, <laughs> but I know that it's just kind of like uh, a class that comes after the original, right? So with subsection, I'm going to add a colon, nth child, and then opening and closing parentheses, and I want to say even. All right, so what I'm telling the browser is, all right, well, I want to target subsection, but only every other even subsection. So now if I click Save and Close, notice that the change is only being applied to the second one. And if I had a fourth one, it would only be applied to this one. Now, just think about the magic of this, is this is a CMS collection, but we're making a change to just this specific um, subsection. That's beautiful. Uh, but we're not quite done because if you'll notice, the way that these are laid out is the white box kind of um, uh, overlaps behind the photo. And here, it's moving beyond the browser. So we need to fix that. All right, so with this selected, let's go ahead and copy our CSS class. Hop back into the embed. Open the code editor. Add the class with opening and closing brackets. And what we need to do is... Uh, Actually, I should show you <laughs> how the original is built. So if we look at the original built, we can figure out, OK, how do we make that change? So the way that I had this overlap is I used absolute positioning. And then I had it start negative 50% from uh, its parent element, its parent class. So normally, if I had this at 0%, um, the box would be right here. But by making it negative 50%, it's overlapping behind this photo. So what I need to do with this one is just move that negative 50% over here to the right. All right, so let me go back to the embed. So what I need to do is say, all right, left needs to be 0% instead of 50. And right needs to be negative 50%. But we're going to run into an issue. Well, first of all, I need to fix that misspelling. <laughs> where that's going to apply to every single one of these classes. And we don't want that to happen either, right? So all we can do is we can actually just copy this with the pseudo class included, paste it in front of that one. And kind of like what's that telling the browser is, hey, I want you to target subsection content wrapper, but only if it's the every even child of subsection. <laughs> All right, so now if I save and close, you notice that it's only being applied to this subsection. All right, one more thing. Now if I click on here, the way that I have set this up is that it's got a margin of 33%. Because remember, technically, the that white box starts over here. So I need to push the content over to the right so that this shows up correctly. All right, so now I just got to move that 33% over to the other side. So I'm going to copy this class, go out to HTML embed, scroll down. <laughs> and we're going to do the same thing. We're going to add the class. We're going to copy and paste this. Add our opening and closing brackets. And then we just need to change the margin so margin left needs to be 0%, and it needs to be margin right, 33.33%. All right, so now this has moved into the correct position, and we've got that nice staggered look that we were going for. All right, now that we've modified a item inside of a collection, you've probably realized how powerful the pseudo class of nth child can be. 
but it can actually do more. Uh, so I want to show you two more examples before I move on. If I scroll down to my FAQ section I've built here, uh, I really like how this looks, but I kind of want to remove the bottom border from the last child. So if I go up to my live site, I just like how it looks with having kind of like this more empty space below. All right, so but how do I remove something from the last child? And I've kind of answered uh, my own question in the response. <laughs> All right, so let's hop back into here. And what we want to do is target the class that has that element applied to it, the bottom border. So FAQ outer is the class that has that bottom border attached. Uh, so I need to copy that class, open up my HTML embed here. Go ahead and add that and say, I think it's border, if I'm remembering the CSS property correctly, border bottom none. All right, if I did that correctly, the border should disappear from all of the children. Now again, we only want it to disappear from the last one. So um, interestingly enough, there's kind of like a similar version of nth child called last child. And so I just add that colon, last child, and hit save. Now, wait a minute, it's still subtracting the border from all of them. And the reason for that is because if you look in the navigator, uh, FAQ outer is the one we're targeting, but really there's only one of the FAQ outer inside of the FAQ collection item. So in other words, this one is the first, last, and every child inside of FAQ collection item. But there's more than one FAQ collection item. So really, what I need to do is get the last child of FAQ collection item and then target FAQ outer inside of it. <laughs> All right, so let me just show you what I mean instead of talking about it. So if I copy this class, uh, and then let's go ahead and close all of this down, go to the embed, scroll back down, open it up. So what I want to do is target that FAQ collection item class. So last child, I can remove that from here. And now what we're telling the browser is, hey, with the last collection item, go ahead and add a border bottom of none to the FAQ outer. Now that I've saved that, you'll notice that, all right, our border is now gone from that last child. All right, I want to show you one more thing we can do with a similar pseudo class to nth child. If I scroll down, I've got this section here that has just this like wall of text. And uh, typically when I have this, I like to dress it up in some way so that it doesn't feel so like bland. So if I go out to the, my live site, you notice that I added this little drop cap. Now drop caps are when the first letter of that um, piece of copy or wall of text, if you will, if that first letter just has a special styling attached to it so that it kind of dresses it up. It reminds us of kind of like elegant um, traditional newspapers or like old manuscripts, just kind of gives it that sense of elegance or professionalism. So I really like that. So if I go back to Webflow, uh, I want to target this drop cap CSS style. What I can do is go to open editor, add in my class, drop cap, open and closing brackets, and then I've previously copied uh, all of the CSS style for that specific drop cap just to save us time, uh, since really the whole point of this is to target that first letter. And if I hit save and close, you'll notice, wait a minute, it's targeting the entire paragraph, and that's because we haven't added our uh, pseudo class yet. So remember, the class we're using is first letter. All right, so now just that first letter of the paragraph is being targeted and it gives it that nice, beautiful vintage look. If you're watching this tutorial and you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed about how complex it is, I don't blame you. <laughs> I'm specifically speaking to uh, intermediate or advanced folks here and it might be an indicator that my Webflow for Beginners class on Skillshare might be a better fit. I try to speak to folks who have zero knowledge of HTML or CSS, zero knowledge of Webflow, and what we do is together we build a one-page portfolio website for a photographer, and over about four hours or so, I kind of carefully walk you through from the beginning how to do that 
so that you can get introduced to using Webflow and, and becoming a developer in general. Um, now, Skillshare is a paid membership model, so it's about eight bucks a month or so. But if you use the link that I've included in the description box below, you actually get two months of Skillshare for free, after which you can cancel and you can watch my class, uh, not having to have paid anything. <laughs> um, so I encourage you to check it out. And now let's get back to the tutorial. The next piece of custom code that we're going to um, cover is object fit. Now, what object fit lets us do is control how an image responds to its style, like if it's set to a specific height or width, or if its parent element is controlling how it's sized. We kind of are able to tell the browser, here's how I want you to display. Now, W3, uh, one of the resources I mentioned before, has a great documentation page on this. Uh, so it'll show you this is like the original photo. This is what it looks like when it's sized to 200 by 400 pixels, so quite vertical. And here's what it looks like with object fit cover applied. So it's kind of like how we can use the cover um, property with background images, but we're applying it to image elements as opposed to background images. Now with a specific example, we're working on this logo grid. Now when I've worked with clients on <laughs> logo grids, typically it's for like, they want to show who their clients are or they want to show like uh, who has left them reviews and they want to be able to upload these. So this is actually in a CMS collection. So you notice that I've got a collection I've already added here. And so remember that one change we make to one logo gets applied to all of them. And the issue is that the client is going to be uploading theirs too through the CMS. Um, and they're not going to necessarily care about uh, what size they're uploading or what ratio they're uploading it. Um, they're just going to upload whatever logo they have because they don't know how to do anything different. So on our end, we got to make sure, all right, how do I, how do I code this or develop this so that these show like they kind of fit together as a family. They're, they're sized proportional to each other. Uh, well, object fit makes this super easy. So what we're going to do is I previously figured out kind of what I would want the maximum width and height to be. So I know I want the maximum width to be around 65 pixels and the height to be around 52. Now the issue is you see that some of these are getting <laughs> really stretched and looking rough. Um, so what we can do is we can copy our CSS class, go up to HTML embed, scroll back down so we can see what we're doing, <laughs> and then open up the embed, call our CSS class, opening and closing brackets. Let's scroll down so we can see what we're doing. And this is where we use the object fit CSS property. Oops, sorry, <laughs> it gets spelled. Okay, and we're gonna be using the value contain. Now what contain does is it makes sure that, all right, if you've set it to 65 by 52, I'm gonna resize the image so that it's contained inside of that box. Um, and that way, the whole logo is gonna show up. It's not gonna be cut off or look weird. So now we've got a nice logo grid that looks like everything is kind of proportional to each other. All right, now if you noticed uh, earlier in the website, we've also got these images and they're set to a specific ratio. And this one in particular is a really vertical photo and it's looking super scrunched. All right, so what we can do is use object fit for this as well. Uh, so I'm going to target image 100, this particular CSS class. Click on my embed, open the editor, and we're going to add this right below here. And we're going to be using the same CSS property, object fit. But instead of the value contain, we're going to use cover, just like they did in the documentation for W3. All right, so now that I added cover, now you see that this image is showing up in the correct ratio and it looks great. With this last section, we're going to be working on two more pieces of code. A media query is one, but first I want to target line clamping. What line clamping is, is if I go back to my live site, when a paragraph is kind of truncated to a custom amount of lines, in this case, two. If I hop back into my designer, <laughs> you notice that the paragraph is actually quite large. And if I open up the CMS collection, uh, I've inputted this really big paragraph here into the teaser blurb section, uh, and it's showing up here. Now, what's great about this is if I'm able to truncate this to two lines, no matter what the client enters into this field, 
it's always going to have a nice uniform seamless look because I'm truncating the text to just two lines. The way I'm doing it is using uh, this method here in CSS text. Now I told you that I'm always looking at documentation. <laughs> it's really, really helpful. And uh, he calls it the weird WebKit Flexbox way. <laughs> but he's got this note down here that says that it's actually gotten a lot of browser support and it's now a little bit more mainstream. So all we're gonna do is actually copy this code here um, and make use of it ourselves. So I copied that to my clipboard, go back out and I've named this line clamp just to make things nice and easy. I'm going to click on HTML embed, scroll back down so that we can see our work, open it up, and right below uh, what we just added, let's add line clamp, paste in our custom code, and then I want to make sure these line up nicely. <laughs> just personal preference there. And then the one thing I want to uh, just draw your attention to is this second line. And what this three represents is how many lines we want to clamp it at. And I personally just wanted two. All right, now it's not quite looking like it should. And that's because with line clamp selected, we need to make sure that overflow hidden is selected. Uh, so what that means is that anything that's showing up outside of this box is going to be hidden from view. And now it's showing up uh, exactly as we want it. And it's even adding those three little ellipses at the end to indicate that the text is cut off. Uh, so this is just really, really great because like I said, the client can enter in as much uh, text as they want, but we're going to have this nice uniform look. Now, the thing I should mention is if um, if you're using a rich text block for your blog article, this method does not work with rich text blocks. It's got to be just a regular paragraph field in the CMS. Uh, but what I always do personally with my clients is I've got a rich text box for the blog article. Then I've got a regular paragraph field for the teaser or blurb, and I use the truncating on it. Last up, but definitely not least, is media queries. Now, what media queries let us do is create custom breakpoints. Breakpoints are when we tell the browser, hey, anything above this, style the website this way, and anything below it, instead, style the website this way. Now, the default breakpoints for Webflow are up here. Uh, so desktop is, of course, the first one. If I hit number two, I'm at the tablet version of the breakpoints. Three is landscape portrait. And then four is uh, portrait mobile. I think I said that correctly. <laughs> Anyways, um, uh, outside of that, without using custom code, we don't really have access to breakpoints. Um, so let's take, for example, this blog grid. Right? Now, if I come out here to uh, my... Um, live site. Now here I'm looking at it at this 27 inch monitor and it looks great. But that's because it's nice and big. But what if I was looking at this on like a 13 inch laptop and those are about 1,280 pixels wide or so. So if you're looking in the bottom right corner there, oh, once I hit that diamond, <laughs> you can see that it says Retina MacBook or MacBook Pro earlier 13 inch models. That's kind of like a smaller laptop. And so what if somebody was looking at this blog grid at this size uh, maybe I want this to be a two column layout instead of three columns. And the problem is if I made that change uh, here, it would be the change for all desktops. Um, so I can't create a custom breakpoint at that 1280 pixel mark unless I use a little bit of custom code. All right, so what we're going to do is we're going to use um, <laughs> the uh, documentation for media queries in W3. And here they've got a great example of how this works. So uh, what this line basically means is saying, hey, if the screen is 600 pixels or below, I want you to hide or set the display to none to this div. So that's kind of uh, very close to what we want. So we're gonna copy that, open up Webflow, go to the HTML embed, open that up, and we're just gonna copy and paste that right in there. All right, and then we need to add um, a closing bracket. And then anything inside of this is only going to be applied when the screen is this size. Now, 600 is a bit small. Remember, we wanted 1,280 pixels. All right. Now we need to figure out what are we going to change. All right. So with this um, grid, I use Flexbox. And I styled the blog children to be a flex basis of 33.33%. .33%. Um, that means that this... Uh, 
flex child is only a third of the size of its parent. Um, and what I want to do is at that smaller screen size um, at 1280 pixels, I want the basis to change to 50% so that now it's a two column layout and it fills up the screen a little bit more nicely. All right, so let's change that to 33.33 again. Copy that class, click on our embed. And inside of that media query, we're going to add our class, opening and closing brackets, and we want to use flux basis. And instead of 33%, we want it to be 50%. Save and close. I'm going to scroll all the way down. Uh, now, nothing has changed, and that's because this uh, current uh, this canvas, this browser, for lack of a better word, is wider than 1,280 pixels. But if I grab that and scroll it in, at 1,280 pixels, it's going to change to that two column layout because it's finally hitting our media query. So if I hover over the little diamond there, it's still showing up as two columns. And once I exceed it, bam, it's back to that nice three column layout for larger desktops. So that's how to create a custom breakpoint with media query. All right, that does it for this tutorial. I hope that you enjoyed it. I know that this was a little bit more of an advanced uh, topic, um, but I know that I've appreciated learning how to particularly customize those CMS collections, so I hope this is useful to you. By the way, um, I'll make sure to link the preview URL so you can access the designer and see how all of this is built. And in that HTML embed, I added some comments to make it a little bit easier to understand uh, what does what. <laughs> uh, so you're welcome to log into that, check it out, and even steal those things for your own projects. Now, if you did enjoy the video and you want to see more, I um, encourage you, please uh, subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you get notified of future videos. I'm thinking about doing one on schema markup uh, next, but if you have any uh, recommendations or things that you'd like to learn about, please let me know in the comments and I'll definitely consider it. And hopefully I'll see you guys in the next video.